Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa paunamu te moana, hei huarahi mā tātou i te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou e tātou katoa, huie, taekie. Ko Moira Clooney, toko ingoa, he uri au nō te rarua. Um, I'm project lead for Te Ngākau Kahukura, and so pleased to welcome you back for the fifth in our um, Takatapui and Rainbow webinar series for Aotearoa's youth sector. Today's korero is about rainbow homelessness, how we can address it systemically, and also how you can support young people who might be homeless, homeless at the moment or at risk of homelessness. Um, I'm joined by three amazing speakers to talk more about that. Just before I introduce them, I wanted to say a little bit more about what Te Ngaka Kahukura is. Um, so Te Ngaka Kahukura is a national initiative that sits in partnership between rainbow communities and Aratayohi, the peak body for the youth sector nationally. Um, we want rainbow people across Aotearoa to grow up feeling safe, feeling like they're valued and that they belong in all the places where they live and learn and work and access support services, whether that's health or social services um, or housing. And that sounds really simple, but unfortunately it's a, it's a huge cope up, but there's still a lot of work to do. Our team is quite small and we work at a systems change level. So we work with people and with organizations who influence the systems around young people, um, funders, politicians, researchers, training providers, sector bodies, government agencies, um, youth services, to grow understanding of rainbow populations and issues and to help people to do the work within their own sphere of influence. The whakatauki that Dr. Elizabeth Kirikiri gave us that speaks to our work up on the screen now, um, kia puawai, me puawai, we think of this in terms of in order for our rainbow young people to flourish and to do well, we must grow, we must do the work ourselves. So our work is really about supporting people to strengthen their services and grow their practice and understand what doing the work looks like um, in the context of where they are. This free webinar series has been for anyone who works with young people across Aotearoa, whether that's at a more of a policy level, or whether it's working directly with young people in their whānau. Um, and with this series, we've really wanted to try and get into some conversations that are a bit deeper than just the 101 stuff around, um, introductory stuff around language and identities and concepts and that kind of thing. So we might not cover off all the questions that you have today. I encourage you to check out our website, read more, um, and please do get in touch if you want to ask us anything else. For today, if you have a question, um, you can pop it in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. That's the easiest way for us to see it. And you're also welcome to use the chat if you want to introduce yourself or add anything, just um, add a comment. Just make sure you have it set to um, all panelists and attendees so that other people can see it too. So uh, let's get into it. So um, our three panelists today are uh, Nehana Gordon Stables, who is the homelessness support worker at Rainbow Youth. Um, Nick Simons, who is my colleague, um, our homelessness lead at Tingako Kahukura, um, and leading our Making Space initiative in partnership with Rainbow Youth. And Taiko Vandenberg, who is doing their PhD around trans homelessness. So I'll pass through to the three of you. I'm really looking forward to um, getting into this corridor. Our co purpose today is about yeah addressing rainbow homelessness. As I say, at, either at a policy level, how do we address this nationally or um, through to kind of how do we support young people who are going through this. Um, we'll see where the conversation goes um, and depending what the what our um, audience is keen to talk, talk more about too. But um, for the three of you, could you each um, tell us a bit more about yourself and your work on this kaupapa? Um, maybe if I hand over to Nehana first. Good evening, Kozo. Um, I am the homelessness support worker for Rainbow Youth. Um, I've been with Rainbow Youth for oh, like eight, nine-ish months now. Um, and my mahi basically is that um, really I try working alongside um, other organizations, um, either as an advocate or an agent for young people who come to me. So I work um, straight with them. Um, to house them, really. Um, and what that looks like um, is very different for every young person who needs it, who comes through my service. Um, and so that'll be something that we talk about um, when that happens. 
um, and trying to house them in LGBT um, oriented spaces as much as possible um, and trying to make them those, those housing as well like as safe as possible. Um, yeah, I think that's that's me really <laughs> so far. Like, do you want to go? Sure. <laughs> um, yep. So I'm, as mentioned, doing my PhD um, under technically community psychology slash liberation psychology, um, investigating trans and gender diverse homelessness in Aotearoa. Um, I started this project in about 2016, probably around to this date. So I'm at like a five year mark. And um, it, for me, one of the biggest observations I've had is actually just the remarkable shift that has happened in that time. So when I started this project, not only was I engaging in this work as a researcher, but I had to do a lot of informal advocacy for young people because at that time there was just nothing out there. Um, I actually ended up having to take a break about halfway through just because of how exhausting it got having to hold that dual position. So. You know, I feel like kind of blessed now that we have people like Nehana in these roles where I can actually refer people on, not have to hold that space and know that they're going to get the support that they need. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask me any questions, um, even hard ones, throw them at me. But yeah, I'll hand over to Nix. Cool. Kia ora koutou. My name is Nicole Nick Simons. So I am currently working with Tenako Kahukura as of April this year and um, as the homelessness lead and also project lead for uh, a new amazing project called Making Space, um, which we might talk about a little bit later. And prior to that, I uh, spent 16 months working with the LifeWise Trust as a peer support team leader, uh, running two services, um, an outreach service and an emergency housing um, navigation service. And generally have worked in the mental health, addictions, homelessness space for almost 10 years now as someone with lived experience. Um, yeah, so thank you for having me on this webinar. <laughs> Thanks to all of you. Um, I guess just to kick off um, with a general question, uh, what do you think, would, what is the current state of housing for rainbow people in Aotearoa? Um, maybe starting with you, Nehana, you were saying um, when you're supporting young people, you um, try and get them housed in kind of LGBT oriented spaces when you can. Um, are there any of those? <laughs> are there many of those? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it really depends on like kind of like where we're looking really. Cause if I'm, when I'm saying like LGBT oriented spaces, I'm really talking about adults um, in like flooding situations. So really we're trying to find like flooding situations where there's other like queer people and they're able to like, um, yeah, be in a house that's, that's relatively safe for them. Um, but if we're talking about people under 18, then there's nothing um there's there's absolutely nothing there's like things that look like um you may have like let's say like one queer person who's like on a team for instance uh, on a housing team um that that's kind of what that looks like really um for under 18s uh, immediate emergency housing is a motel um so you'll be 16 in a hotel um so that's not lgbt friendly um, if we're moving you on to youth housing, um, then you're either looking at not being able to get into that youth housing because you don't meet the criteria, or you're going to be able to get into that youth housing, but you don't get to pick who you're living with. So that would be like a flatting situation again, but for someone under 18, kind of like independent living, um, probably just with one other person. Um, and they'll try as hard as they can um, to get you with someone who also may be queer, but you may just not be lucky and that you may be stuck with someone who, who may not be the case. Um, so if you're under 18, um, yeah, most likely not. But if you're over 18, we could most likely find something for you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, we know that youth homelessness is an issue generally across Aotearoa, um, we've been hearing a lot, I mean, particularly from the Manaki Rangatahi Collective, I think, have some really 
strong leadership in this space. Um, but I wonder, um, Taiko, maybe if you could say a little bit about generally what we know about rainbow youth homelessness. What are the issues, particularly for rainbow young people, and is it is it worse? Um, I guess the most blunt way I can put it is definitely worse. Um, like uh, for trans people, we're looking at about like one in three trans people experiencing some form of homelessness in their lifetime. Um, the statistics around rainbow youth more general is a little bit, uh, it changes, it fluctuates depending on the context. So like most of what we know is from the United States just due to the lack of research being done here. And that's in general, we have quite a lack of research for youth homelessness, let alone our populations more specifically. Um, I can't remember the most recent statistics from sort of the Northern American context, but they say in the youth homeless population, around 40% of those young people will be LGBTQ. So again, a massive overrepresentation compared to like the general population. Um, and the reasons for that are just, it, it's pretty much so interwoven with a lot of different things going on in society. So we know that young queer people are more likely to be experiencing poverty. And then on top of that, there are less support networks as Nehane has kind of alluded to. So if you end up in that position of being at risk of homeless, you're far less likely to have that sort of web of support under you. Um, and in New Zealand, you know, we do have you know, working income, but we know again that those services are kind of problematic no matter who you are. So let alone if you add on, you know, being queer or transgender, then uh, in general, we know it's not going to be a fun time. I'll put it that way. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's kind of such a tricky thing, but I think one of the biggest issues is just that for our communities, there really is no sort of, I guess, you know, there isn't that safety net that we often talk about for other people. It just simply isn't there. So we've got people like Nehana having to essentially be that safety net for an entire population. And, you know, we just know that that's just pretty much impossible. So yeah, for it's, I guess, quite a lot of structural stuff, I would say, are um, leading to LGBT QI plus dot 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 uh, homelessness and that's where we really need to focus our efforts is really on that systemic structural level. Um, Nix, do you have any observations to add to that? Yeah, just total what has been shared and I guess just from my experience of working in the homelessness space for a while now, um, I guess not and, and in a traditional like support service setting, um, just, you know, recognizing the real need for advocacy, the real need to walk alongside people through those processes. You know, I think, like you said, accessing WINS and MSD, you know, is daunting for anyone, let alone, you know, people who um, are really, really vulnerable. So um, being able to totoko and stand alongside them to elevate their voices and also um, advocate for safer spaces. Um, in my time working at LifeWise, um, Something that was really concerning to me was the visibility of rainbow identifying people accessing services and the question of like, you know, we, we know that this is a real problem, but like, where are they, you know, and, and where are they accessing support and, um, and or why are they potentially not accessing mainstream support services, you know, and opening that question up. So um, I guess that kind of brings to the project that I'm in at the moment, which is making space. And that is a collaborative uh, cross-sector approach to building the capacity um, and competency of um, housing and homelessness services to um, talk about, you know, are your services safe? Are your services effective? Um, is the support that you're getting from, you know, the people who are there supposed to help you effective, you know, and empowering and, um, yeah, so we're just opening that door, you know, we're really feeling, I'm feeling really grateful that this conversation is opening up so that we can um, not only support rainbow identifying people in their journey, you know, of housing and homelessness, but um, also look at the sector at a wider level, you know, around um, 
how to staff, how to frontline staff, you know, sector leaders, um, hold those conversations, hold those spaces, you know. Um, yeah, <laughs> we've got specific questions about the project, Moria, I'm not sure, yeah. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> it does come up and just a reminder to people watching, if you have any questions, um, pop them in the Q&A or feel free to introduce yourself or add any comments in the, the chat function as well. Um, yeah, I wonder if any of you can speak to kind of how can existing housing providers um, better support the rainbow young people who come through their services or who maybe don't come through their services um, and don't see them as um, friendly or accessible or safe. What are some of those practical ways that, um, yeah, services can support? I kind of want to like talk with like um, Nix was saying, just kind of like what you said before and kind of like I'm veering off kind of what you said really in regards to this question is a lot of the things that I see is, is visibility for sure, is that huge thing that organizations can do is, is be like, we're here for rainbow people and then make sure that you are. Um, so, I mean, like using young people's names and taking them seriously and then changing their pronouns as much as possible. We're looking after young people. And when I see organizations not doing that or not taking them seriously, like those are huge harmful things for, for young people who, you know, are, are going through traumatic experiences. Um, that's a massive one for me, especially for the young gender diverse people. Yeah. Anybody? Else? Yeah, I just wanted to um, bounce off that in terms of um, you know sector leaders and service providers, um, but also you know from a women's perspective too. You know, a lot of pushback in terms of accessing just you know real basic emergency housing, transitional, um, lots of pushback into transitional and shared spaces, which we know are really not not appropriate. We know that. Um, emergency housing in general for youth is not appropriate, you know. Um, so also just putting it back on everyone, you know, like we all have a role to play in making sure that we're holding space for people and their unique journey, you know, and really believing them where they're at. And we're really striving for their well-being, you know, and um, taking it really serious. Yeah, so thanks, Nehana. <laughs> I mean, the one thing I would add to that too is just recognizing the context young people are in when they're um, of a minoritized identity. So like one thing I encountered um, through research participants was saying that they felt like a lot of these services were unnecessarily punitive and that they were often quite fearful to challenge you know stuff on you know correcting their pronouns and stuff like that and maybe these young people would slowly disengage from the services and the response from those services will then essentially just to discharge them for me it's about bringing in a conversation that actually these young people aren't just being difficult or whatever that actually to recognize those needs and even to recognize them pulling back from the service that that's an issue that is actually structural it's not an issue in that young person and so when we start getting these people who are often labeled as the tricky cases or the difficult young people i think it's really an opportunity to actually step back and be like, so why are they acting like this? What is making them react in this way that we often see as being, I don't know, like potentially challenging or, you know, I've heard some service providers say that, you know, I'm trying to support them and they feel like this young person is doing everything to make their life harder. But really it's just about bringing in that conversation is why are they acting like that? Why are they pulling away? What can we do to draw them back in? And, I, and that's not at all to, I guess, speak badly about anyone working in frontline services. I think it's just about recognizing that you are also in a difficult position. We're in quite a penal and conditional welfare system. So it's again, holding that space and making sure you're not getting drawn into that discourse as well. And just really bringing that real humility into the room when you're dealing with young people. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks Taiko. What that made me think of too was um, something um, 
from one of Rainbow Youth's kind of resources about um, tips for housing providers, <coughs> which was around um, recognizing um, the situation that young people might be in in terms of their home life. That you know, um, some of the barriers might be around um, service providers not understanding the impacts of um, transphobia or homophobia at home, and just thinking, well. Um, you know, this young person isn't really like doesn't really have housing pressures, and um, they just need to sort things out with their family. Um, yeah, I wondered if you could speak to that a little more. Yeah, I think that is a method one. Is that I, a lot of it is just in terms of how we understand homelessness being this lack of four walls and a roof, and so yeah, we do. I've, I've noticed it not only from participants, but even just, you know, peers in the community that they'll go in seeking support and uh, the response as well. Maybe just don't dress that name in your home, um, dress that way in your home. Don't use that name or don't pressure your parents to essentially respect you for who you are, because that way, you know, you will technically still have a home. So it's putting young people in this quite awful position where they have to choose between do I live as someone who isn't me just essentially so I have a bedroom or do I access, well, attempt to access these services, probably not actually be able to access them and end up living either on the streets or couch surfing. So again, it's about making sense of the fact that actually being not respected in those circumstances, either in your flat or amongst your own whanau, that that actually is incredibly damaging. That isn't something that young people can just put to the side and be like, you know, that's less important than having a roof over my head. Because we know that actually a lot of young people will end up choosing to couch surf or to live on the streets because they feel more often even safer in those contexts. And that's quite a horrific thing to think of is that a young person feels safer on the streets than, you know, living in this house. Because for them, that is a house that's just a physical structure. It's not a home. It's not offering those other things that we know as humans we need to have a home. Um, I guess, Nehana, have you had any young people kind of experience that difficulty? Sorry, can you run on the difficulty with what, sorry? Yes, I guess essentially being in that gray area where they technically could have access to a house, but for you know whatever reason, it doesn't offer that sort of full home environment. Absolutely, no, yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that, that happens quite a lot, actually. I, I would say that's a good, good amount of the young people that end up coming to me is that they will have like a housing residence, um, at a roof, let's say, um, but it's not a home and in fact they're being it's actually making their mental health quite like terrible and the fact that I would see quite a lot of young people end up or have been already before coming to me in respite many times um, before coming to me and then have been told respite that they don't want to go home um, but they do, do end up going back home to then be coming back to respite again um, and then reaching out to my service um, after realizing that they just can't keep going through this circle kind of process. Yeah, so that happens quite a lot. Um, just thinking about those kind of skills for youth workers or housing workers working with rainbow young people. We've had a question come through from um, one of our attendees, which is just around language. So this person, um, I think we've probably been using the word queer in terms of talking about who we're working with and this person um, personally finds that word offensive and wonders about um, yeah would that language change to talking about rainbow customers or clients I guess um, just more broadly um, how yeah if you're if, in terms of working with rainbow um, young people how would somebody know what the right language was to use what what words to avoid I feel like just work frontline, like working with young people that like um, any 
personally this hasn't really come up like with young people before um like i feel like for young people language is always changing um and they'll always to be honest these young people that i work with are pretty on to telling me when um something <laughs> is um is like wrong for them with language um and they're supremely straight up um but check-ins always with young people um uh, along the side of just like meeting young people where they're at like things will be different and you know like one day to another and kapai that's all goods we'll just keep changing um so so thank you um uh janet um who like asked that question um for, for that for that part for that question um as well does anyone else have any kind of like input around that i just want to talk with that really um i just think it's really important when we you're working with people who um yeah just giving opportunities for autonomy, you know, it's like so important, you know, choice and change and fluid and flexibility um, in a system that is quite um, structured, you know, and restrictive and um, discriminatory, <laughs> really, for lack of a better word. So, um, yeah, I just really want to say, Nehano, you're right in that sense. It's so important to check in with each individual and that you can't generalise you know um yeah it's really important yeah i think um something that um i've tended to talk about in this space too is just yeah just to, again around not making assumptions like if a young person is using language that you're not familiar with um you know, there can be lots of like different or unfamiliar identity terms that young people are using these days that you just might not have heard before is um, just asking what that means for them. Um, you, you don't have to feel as though you have to know what all the words are and um, it's not about kind of reading a list of terminology and kind of learning what those mean because um, people might be using them in different ways. So it's more about yeah working with that person to um, talk to them about what that means to them um, and, and what they mean when they say that word. Um, so yeah, I just add that around not making assumptions. Um, are there any other sort of bouncing off that? Um, what are some other things you think it's important for people working with um, rainbow young people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness to know or understand? That is such a. <laughs> Um, yeah. I mean, I guess the most simple one is just treat them how you would hope to be held if you were accessing the same service, um, putting aside any sort of social positioning or identity they have and just see it as actually this is a person who needs support how can I best support them in a respectful manner? And like I said, be open-minded. Um, you know, we're all in a quite tricky position. I think a lot of people working on the front lines are also in very difficult positions. And I think we just need to be quite honest to ourselves and young people about that, that also, you know, on both sides of the fence, it's a difficult position to be in, particularly if you're trying to help a young person of any sort of minoritized identity, you know, you might not be able to support them in the way that you would hope, but you know, what can you do to make that as stressless as possible for that person, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, um, I feel like my biggest one is just like, I'm gonna try and like word this and wait <laughs> like and then yeah it's really just like starting with like advocacy like and just like a billion times like advocacy and like like I just have multiple words kind of like spinning around really weird like like advocacy and then another word is kind of just like um the labeling like young people is like too hard kind of thing and they, I feel like they really coexist together in a way where like I see young people being dropped um, very quickly um, because they're either too hard or they don't know how to advocate for that young person 
and reaching out to other organizations where you can find that help with your advocacy for that young person, I feel like is the biggest thing that I would love to see. And it's not like I don't, I do see that. I love love people like coming out and, and, um, and contacting me um, for like questions that they have. Um, But yeah, just, I think that's probably the biggest thing for me really, yeah. I, I total put that as well, huge on advocacy. Um, like I said earlier, walking alongside that person. And I think, I think also like reflective practice is really important, you know, around like who you are and like, have, you know, did you listen enough? You know, I think listening is really important, creating enough space um, for that young person to be able to just express where they're at, you know, on that day, <laughs> you know, it's a very like survival basic here, now, what are the needs? you know, um, we sort of drowning a little bit in like systemic change, you know, this real need to address youth homelessness and rainbow homelessness and all the gaps that we have. But we've got people here right now in this moment who just need aroha, you know, they need to be held, they need to be supported, they need to be listened to, you know, and affirmed for who they are and, and where they're heading and where they want to be, you know, and kind of like building a little bit of hope in that space. Um, you know, so when I speak about reflective practice, it's like, well, did I do enough in that space today? You know, um, but also like, how does my organization, how could, how could we be better? <laughs> you know, you know, what have we come up against today that was just really hard, you know, and, and how can I be a better advocate for change in that space, whether it is trying to engage with a different service provider that has different values or perhaps policies and stuff that, just doesn't make it easy to access or um, yeah, just where, where are the blockages? You know, how can we create more space? <laughs> how can we make it easier? You know, when we're really, you know, at the beginning of this saying that the state of rainbow homelessness and youth homelessness is that it, it doesn't exist. You know, we don't have rainbow and youth specific services and not only advocating for that particular individual, but at a wider level, you know, holding our government, um, our country accountable to making sure that everyone has the right to housing that's safe and good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks, Max. Um, I guess, yeah, taking that kind of slight zoom out, we've been talking a bit about um, working individually or with, with whānau um, at more of a frontline level. Um, if we're thinking about um, people who... who design services or who make decisions, um, what are some of the things that you'd want to see housing services put in place um, to make them more accessible and more safe and friendly for rainbow young people or rainbow people in general? Um, Who wants to take that one? (laughs) I guess... um, really big question <laughs> <laughs> it is so a really many, big question there's so many ways we can go with that um one thing that comes to my head is like less pushback you know more acceptance you know how do you how do you make your organization service affirming for everyone who works, walks through that door you know um how do we make it easy like yeah, like we can get into like forms and like all the paperwork and all these identifiers and actually criteria, 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 do you fit, you know? When we've got people who are struggling with, you know, having to choose parts of themselves, which is just such a painful place to be when their whole self should be welcomed and loved and accepted and supported, you know, it's like, oh, my mind gets a bit, a bit big on that. <laughs> I don't know if you want to add, I see Nehana, yeah. <laughs> uh, running with you off the paperwork, that is a huge one for me. A lot of the time I feel like I am an amazing race with a young person who's like coming to me um, and they have left home with no ID uh, whatsoever. Um, and we're having to go around every single like different departure of ways to find identification. Um, within one day so that we can get them into emergency housing like on the day um, yeah that one is that one is super super hard um, and another one for me is like cultural practical cultural mediation 
um, with with young people um, and their families if they still need that. Um, and if they don't, then with them. Um, and I feel like that's going to be different. Uh, that's going to look different for every young person where they are um, and for every different organization as well. Um, and that's still something that um, we're on a journey here at Rainbow Youth with as well. And me personally as well with my practice. Um, but just trying to make our services as culturally like respondent as, as possible um, and just learning. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the biggest one, I mean, thinking quite structurally here, but um, is just to kind of de-silo our services and actually have that communication across the board. So, you know, because one of the one of the biggest narratives I hear is, you know, if we became this perfect country where homophobia and transphobia didn't exist, these young people wouldn't be homeless. And I'll be like, actually, that's not the case. Even if we remove those factors, we still have so many issues with things like poverty, with people accessing, you know, social services. So what can we do in our positions as, you know, housing providers to actually also advocate in that space, across those spaces, not just taking this very microscopic approach and looking at, you know, focusing on these identities or looking at them as one dimensional, you know, what are some of the other issues in these young people's lives, you know, um, like disability being a big one. Um, what are you going to do if you get like a gender diverse person who's also neurodivergent or disabled? For them, actually, their trans identity might be taking a back seat towards the difficulties that they're experiencing in terms of living in like an ableist world. So again, also making sure that while we're also working across sectors that we're also looking beyond the singular identity in these young people that we're looking at like, I guess a big picture in general, which is obviously easy for me to say, but I think we do just need to shift our thinking a little bit more to that approach as well. Cool, thank you all. Um, and just a reminder to people watching, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A or, um, or chuck them in the, the chat as well. Just make sure you have it set to all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see. Um, trying to think what else to ask next. <laughs> um, what a, I mean, thinking about um, making services more accessible, um, maybe Nehana, what are some of the barriers that you have encountered um, trying to get rainbow young people into services? Yeah, I think the biggest part of my service right is emergency help really and so that's probably one of the biggest barriers that I hit um, with my mahi um, and that tends to look yeah that really shows up um, the services with emergency housing um, and that can look like for instance um, me trying to get a uh, an 18 year old trans woman into emergency housing um, and being hit into a wall that um, she's not allowed um they're, they're kind of like relatively refusing to put single people into uh, motels now um so there'll be transitional housing um but i'm not going to put a trans woman in there um and then i'll call up and i'll do that um and then they'll send me to a male um transitional housing um house that's happened on multiple occasions um, they now know who I am, um, so now they'll just give me a number and I'll call it and they'll be like, this is a male transitional housing um, house. I'll be like, no, that's not where we're going to go. Um, it can look like um, uh, a young person not being able to get into emergency housing on the day um, just because no one's like been able to look at the file um, in that day. Um, or that they just don't know where to put this young person, the 16 year old. Um, uh, or yeah, it can just look like dependent on whether or not you're going to get a caseworker for that worker who wants to do that file in the day or not. Um, and I'm just very persistent. So I'll call a thousand times in the day or I'll call their manager and that seems to work. Um, but if I didn't have those manager numbers, then I wouldn't be able to get that young person into emergency housing on the day. Um, and those aren't, there's, there's, there's like one story out of many, there are many other stories that I could probably pick out as well. 
Um, yeah, but there are many, many barriers. Yeah, um, emergency housing for a young person in that day can be extremely stressful because I will have to tell them that I don't know if they will get into emergency housing on that day or not. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm thinking, uh, Taiko was thinking about conversation we've had previously about your research. And I think a lot of the people that you talked to who experienced homelessness hadn't necessarily engaged with services at all, hey? Yeah, I think it's also a conversation we need to have more broadly is around how we understand homelessness because we do in this country have this idea when we think of a homeless person, our brain kind of goes to, you know, a person living on the street, um, someone who's rough sleeping, someone who's panhandling. Um, and actually a lot of the time that's not the case for these young people who they're moving between their friends' houses, couch surfing, and they don't even recognize that as being homeless. I think particularly in the trans community, quite unfortunately, homelessness has almost been normalized to an extent where couch surfing is almost seen as part of the trans experience or as a normal experience, when actually we need to make sure that people don't know that actually that is abnormal and that isn't a way you should be living your life and that the, uh, there are organizations, or at least I hope we're leaning towards getting organizations where you can go and seek help. And also one of the things is sometimes they will go and um, approach places for help and then, you know, they'll encounter some of the barriers that Nehan has talked about, or they'll be told that, you know, they haven't been homeless for X, Y, Z amount of time in X, Y, Z kind of way, and so they're not eligible. And that's kind of one of the things I've been noticing in terms of, you know, for example, Housing First, which is now being positioned as this thing, which is going to end homelessness in New Zealand, yet we're only really opening it up for people who have chronic housing. And again, that's up for these services to decide. And, you know, if we're getting a lot of young people who will never actually sleep on the street because they've accessed this kind of informal community support, which is couch surfing, then realistically, those people are never gonna be able to access housing first in its current manifestation. So again, we really need to think about how homelessness isn't this one static thing. It's not that person sleeping under a bridge. And also recognizing that there isn't a hierarchy. So some young people are like, well, I don't feel like I deserve to access that service because I'm not on the street and that's not as serious. And part of that actually is reframing that actually we know from even just research that the sort of health and well-being effects of couch surfing are quite similar to someone living on the street. So again, we need to sort of break down that imposed hierarchy that one is more serious than the other when actually homelessness full stop is a serious thing that we need to combat. So yeah. Thank you. Um, we've had another question come through from a, an attendee, which um, might be one for you as well, Tycho, um, which is just generally around what are the main reasons for rainbow homelessness and are they um, the same in the regions as well as the major centres? Um, this person says, for example, do parents just disown people? Is it all about family breakdown? I think actually that's one of the biggest things I've been trying to counter is that narrative that LGBTQ homelessness is from family rejection. Um, I usually am like, sure, there are a lot of cases where there is family breakdown, but also how can we contextualize that family breakdown? You know, um, I think the moment we start being like, oh, it's just a conflict between child and parent, it's quite easy to individualize homeless to that family or label those people as bad parents or whatever, when really what is the circumstances that those families are in, which also make it harder for them to support their child when they come out as either rainbow identified or gender diverse. Um, so just thinking of examples in my own research, just like, for example, I have had young people from the regions, from working class rural towns, come out to their families and then it does I guess, lead to increased conflict. But actually, if we take a step back and we look what led up to that, these are people from, you know, often Maori families who, again, that family as a whole is under a lot of stress because they're not being able to access these same social services. So when their young person comes out as trans or whatever, it's not as easy as them for, often it's not even, they might not have the same understanding as gender or, 
again, they can't be like, oh, here's this, you know, I'll just send you off to this youth health clinic where they'll support you. For them in that context, that family is under a lot of stress. And actually, a lot of the times young people kind of insinuate that, you know, them coming out was just the needle on the haystack kind of thing, or it was like the final pressure, which leads to homelessness. And actually, it looks like in their lives that they probably would have ended up in insecure housing regardless, just because of this greater, you know, I guess, systemic issues that they're facing in their lives. And so for me, it's very important that we don't take the quick route of being like, okay, you were rejected. When actually, yes, there was some harm done between the parent and the child, but what can we do to realize that actually it wasn't as simple as, you know, transphobia or homophobia? What can we do then to actually support that family unit instead of just being quickly like, well, we'll further detach you from your family or your community or that kind of thing. And I think in terms of the regions and stuff, um, I, I think in general it would be worse because we just don't have as many support services down there. So like um, previously when I worked at Rain Youth, we had a lot of emails from people in the regions and we just really had nowhere to send them. Um, we often, I've heard of people, young people actually traveling to major city centers in the hope that they'll get support there because they've heard that, you know, Wellington or Auckland's like this rainbow utopia and then getting here and then being like, ah, actually it's not much better um so i think it's it's probably quite serious or quite an issue across the board i think you know if you're up in auckland you'd be lucky because you've got someone like nehana you could reach out to and in wellington you might be able to get support through like gender minorities but you know still there's only so much these people can do yeah Cool, yeah, I was thinking um, in terms of that question around the main reasons for homelessness, some of the other kind of things um, I've seen from research are also around discrimination um, within services and within the housing sector generally, like um, the general social survey um, doesn't ask questions about trans identity, but it does ask now about sexuality and um, there was a piece of research that showed um, that uh, I guess LGB um, queer sexual minorities um, people were twice as likely to have their tenancy ended earlier than um, compared to their peers and you know this was controlling for things like age and so socioeconomic status and so really it seemed like probably the only factor there was um, was discrimination from landlords so there's kind of um, discrimination across the whole system that rainbow people might be more likely to experience so I guess that's part of it as well um, I wondered um, Nehana did you have anything to add in terms of the main kind of um, reasons that you're seeing from the young people that you work with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, currently, um, right now, yeah, um, it's it's kind of looking um, like I'm having young um, people of colour um, that are gender diverse um, coming in with already a background of multiple reports of concern. Um, under the belt. Um, so that's kind of where my like red young people are coming from, um, that they're also with quite bad mental health issues that have already been through respite multiple times um, and then having to go back through there as well. Um, a lot of them were, I've been able to house um, but then the only thing that's available to them is individual housing that is only uh, seven to seven hours surveillance, um, as is 24 hours uh, is not currently a thing. Um, and so they end up back in respite. Um, so that's, that's currently kind of what my young people um, in the red kind of zone in my caseload kind of looks like currently, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm wondering in terms of <laughs> solutions, um, I'm wondering, Nix, um, did you want to say a little bit more about the Making Space project and what um, you're hoping to achieve over the next couple of years with that? 
Mm, cool. Uh, so yeah, we're just currently embarking on a project called Making Space, which I said previously is a collaborative approach to building the competency capacity of the housing and homelessness sector. So what that kind of looks like at the moment is um, that we're aiming to build a competency pilot program, competency, competency building pilot program across the Auckland region, um, which is really to look at um, how service providers can create safer, more effective housing uh, support services. And with that will be like a supportive toolkit, um, some tips and that. So what we're doing at the moment is we're just embarking on creating a steering group um, for that project, which is uh, comprised of sector leaders as well as lived experience voices of um, people who are rainbow identifying, uh, experiencing homelessness. So. Um, yeah, we're entering into a co-design process with that. So we're kind of in a, um, Tycho is also involved in this in this process. Um, so yeah, we're really keen to hear from not just people with lived experience of homelessness, but sector leaders around where they're at in their services, where they think they're at, where they'd like to be. Um, so we are really kind of got a call out for people who would like to input into this project around rainbow homelessness. So. Um, yeah, I definitely invite if we do have sector leaders uh, watching this that you're able to reach out and connect with us because we really want to hear from you um, and we want to be able to create this competency program that works for you, you know, works for the organisations, works for these support services um, built on the experiences, you know, and the voices of people either trying to access these services or not, you know, and what that looks like. So um, we're doing a lot of research around those experiences and what some of the solutions might be. So we don't necessarily have the answers right now. We're going to design that together in a real collaborative approach. And I'm really excited about it. <laughs> I think it's such a great opportunity. I'm feeling really grateful that, um, yeah, we've, we've got this, you know, for the next two and a half years. So um, yeah, we're just about to release and launch our website so that people can um, express their interests in contributing. Um, and then, yeah, just a collaboration till the end of this year, hopefully like the design phase of that, really understanding the big picture, what the problem is, potentially getting to some solutions. Um, and we'll see where we go with that. So I don't know if that, <laughs> it's very broad at the moment. You know, we know we wanna build this, this competency program, but um, what that looked like will be dependent on who contributes to this space. So, um, yeah, I just really want to put a call out for people who would like to be kept up to date or to contribute, whether you have lived experience of homelessness or um, are a sector leader that's really passionate and could be a champion for rainbow inclusion in your service. So, yeah. Kia ora. Thanks, Nick. I think um, we're heading towards wrapping up, um, but maybe before we do that, um, if you just each wanted to say um, if people wanted to connect with you or learn more about your work, um, or learn more about the issue in general um, and I guess also too if they're supporting um, somebody who um, or if, if, they're, if they're supporting housing services or they're supporting young people um, how do they what are some um, things you can recommend in terms of where they go to find out more information um, we also just had a, a question in the chat um, asking Nix how do we contact you so maybe Nix do you want to go first if people want to keep in touch with you and your project, um, how should they do that? And is there anything else you want to suggest that people look up? Cool. Uh, so our website should be live in the next week or so, which will be like making-space.nz, I think, <laughs> project. We might be able to link it with the webinar um, afterwards, but my personal email address could also be, um, I'm happy for people to email me, which is just nixnyx at tenakokahukura.nz. So um, that would be the easiest way. Um, yeah, and I'm just keen to hear from people. So thank you. Cool. How about you, Nehana, if people want to uh, get in touch with you or know more about your work, um, how can they do that? Slash if they want to learn more about rainbow homelessness, what should they read? <laughs> Um, if you want to contact me, um, you can just go on our website and you'll be able to find um, my contact details there. Um, if you'd like to refer anybody that you are supporting or you know that would need support um, in Rainbow Services with homelessness, 
um, then you're able to refer them on our website as well. You can just navigate to the homelessness support tab um, and self-refer or refer someone that you think needs help through there. Um, and that's um, ry.org.nz, right? Yeah, it's ry.org.nz. Um, and if you want to learn more about the, what I can do for you, you're welcome to just call me. My phone number is on the website as well as my work phone. Um, and you're able to just call me and I'll call you back and we'll have a have a call you door on that. Thank you. Um, Taiko, what, uh, if people want to keep in touch <laughs> with your work. <laughs> Um, I think actually if you Google my name, it might come up with a university profile, which has my contact details. Uh, my email address is a bit long and convoluted, so I won't attempt to hand it out here. Um, and then, yeah, I'm also happy to distribute research you might not be able to have access to because a lot of it is through things like paywalls. And I'm happy to sneakily send that through if you don't have access, if there is something you do want to look at, I'm, I'm happy to help out in that way as well. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm just thinking too, generally for any of you, um, if people are wanting to um, support communities outside of Auckland, because I'm aware we've sort of been talking about um, Tamaki Makoto in terms of Nix's work and in terms of the scope of um, who Nehan is able to support, what's available around the country or who else should people be getting in touch with? Or is that a loaded question? Because there isn't very much. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, as far as I'm aware, and as you're asking in terms of housing support, yeah, um, there's, there's nothing as far as I'm aware, yeah. Um, but in terms of like helping other kind of like organizations that may be in your area that do need like advocacy, um, or anything, then you're just welcome to call um, like Rainbow Youth um, and we can, you know, like help you in terms of like the things that you should be a, a, a able to ask for, um, the things that you aren't getting. Um, yeah, like those kinds of things. Um, but as far as I'm, do any of you know anything else that maybe I don't know? Carl, okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, I would be reluctant to name any because I'm not sure of the progress being made. I know that there is progress being made in different regions, but again, I actually, I would even encourage those services to reach out to Rainbow so we can build more of a connected network, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Um, so yeah, just, just reaching out, I think, as, 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 as you need, yeah. Kia ora, thank you, and I guess, um, We've got a page up on the Tinga Kahukura website, um, which links to kind of research and policy things around rainbow homelessness, but also the supports that we're aware of. So there's just things like um, there's a rainbow housing um, group on Facebook, which is where a lot of people find flats and that kind of thing. And um, Gender Minorities Aotearoa in Wellington does a lot of advocacy in this space as well. Um, so if, if things become available, um, we'll sort of link things there as well. Um, and as Nick said, hoping to launch the Making Space website within the next few days. So that'll be available as well. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for everything that you've shared today. This has been awesome. But it's been really interesting for me to hear more about your work um, and some of the, the challenges um, and successes that you've all experienced as well. I guess, um, yeah, and thanks to attendees as well for being here today. As I've said, this is the fifth in a series um, of webinars around different rainbow topics um, for the youth sector. If you've missed any of them, you can go back and watch them on our website or they're up on YouTube as well. Um, we'll be taking a brief pause after this one um, to kind of evaluate how this initial series has gone and what people have learned and um, where to go next. So we'll be putting out an evaluation survey in the next few days. Um, to ask about what you feel like you've learned from these and what you've enjoyed, how we could be improving, and also what other topics you'd be keen to hear more about. So if you've registered for this webinar, if you're watching it live, we'll email that out to you. Um, otherwise, if you're watching this as a recording, um, keep an eye on our website and our social media. We're on um, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, as well as YouTube. Um, so we'll share the, the survey link there as well. 
but um, yeah, in the meantime, just thank you so much for being here and for taking the time out of your day to learn more about this topic. Um, really appreciate your presence and your questions and um, yeah, your attention to this. And we'll finish there with a karakia. So uh, karakia tato, unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapunui, kia wātia, kia māma, te ngākau, te tīnana, te wairua i te arataka. Koiara i rongo whakaere ake ki ronga, kia tīna, tīna, huie, kia ora. Thanks everyone.